You are listening to Scribble Talk, a podcast for bid and proposal professionals. My name is Bhaskar Sundram and with my co-host, Ashley Hayes, we will be sitting down with our industry veterans to share their stories, discuss their career and learn how to make an impact in the industry. Today's guest is Ali Paskin. Ali is the founder of Able Solutions LLC and RFP trainer. Ali is a veteran in the world of federal government contracting, having worked a number of years for government contractors to develop and refine successful approaches to winning federal government contracts. She has spent 35 years developing win strategies with expertise throughout the entire phase of proposal development life cycles, primarily for small and mid-sized companies. Ali has an impressive track record of collaborating and managing teams to identify best possible solutions for proposals. She's published in the Journal of Association of Proposal Management Professionals and has lectured nationally. She's an APMP fellow and has earned APMP certification. Welcome, Ali, to Scribble Talk. Great to have you with us. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> so, Ali, we're going to start back at the beginning of everything. Um, we are curious, where were you born and where did you go to high school and get your education? I was born in Baltimore, Maryland, here in the United States. I attended high school at the Catholic High of Baltimore, Eva Catholic High, mm-hmm. and received my bachelor's degree in communications from the University of Maryland University College. Wow. So, so interesting. I feel like we've had many um, people on this uh, podcast from Maryland and Baltimore in particular. So Baltimore must be just breeding proposal professionals. <laughs> <laughs> So, Allie, where was your first job? My very first job, I was a receptionist at a company that no longer exists called Action TV Rental. That was my very first job when I first got out of high school. Wow. So when did you enter the proposal world then? I started working in proposals in 1980s. Wow. I got a job as a secretary at Martin Marietta Laboratories. They called me a secretary because back in those days, proposals was not an identified industry. Mm -hmm. If I held that same job today, I would be called a proposal coordinator. Gotcha. But basically, that was my introduction to proposals. I, I set up the meetings got data calls, typed in the editorial changes, did some light desktop publishing, basically everything a proposal coordinator does today. But that position didn't exist. So because I typed and answered the phones and set up meetings, I was labeled a secretary. Very interesting. It's, It's wonderful that things have changed and we have labels for our actual roles now. Yes, I Um, joke that if I held that job today, I would be making three times as much money as I was back then, too. (laughs) (laughs) Very true as well. (laughs) So can you tell me three things that not many people know about you? Well, I had an article published a couple years ago in a uh, Christian weekly magazine called Power for Living. Mm. I was an associate producer on an extremely low budget horror film called oh, Curse wow. of the Screaming Dead. <laughs> <laughs> and I am a Dracula aficionado. I'm aficionado. I love everything and anything related to Dracula and Transylvania. Wow. Oh my goodness. Those are so very interesting in here. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, so what is your most memorable proposal or capture effort? Hmm. I think my most memorable is I worked on an IDIQ at a company called ISS, and it was a 3.5 
billion dollar effort. It was $35 billion ceiling. Our bid went in at $3.5 billion. And mm-hmm. that was the first billion with a B proposal effort that I was a part of. And I just felt that it was such a big milestone in my career at the time, especially working with a mid-sized company to submit a bid at that large uh, uh, level was quite an accomplishment. I was very proud of that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Those big ones are the memorable ones, right? Yep, absolutely. <laughs> Especially when you did, but you did. Yeah, that's great. At what point, Ali, did you become a member with APMP? Now, this is an interesting story. Mm-hmm. In 1999, I was working for a company called ACI. The two gentlemen who started that company were engineers, Mm -hmm. and they were very active in IEEE and all these professional organizations. When the time came for my performance appraisal, my manager at the time said to me, you know, the owners of the company really push all the employees to be active in their professional organizations. Is there one for people who do proposals? And I said, I don't know, but that doesn't mean one doesn't exist. It just means I've never heard of it. So I went on the internet and I found the APMP. I went back to my boss and I said, You're not going to believe this, but there is, in fact, a professional organization for proposal folks. And he said, you will join, you will attend meetings, you will volunteer and participate, and you will come back with new ideas and things we can do here to improve our proposals. So I was probably one of the few people in APMP who didn't have to justify joining who didn't have to justify going to conferences. I was told when I got the brochure for the uh, um, VidCon that in 2000, it was never a question of, can I go? I was told you are going. Mm. Book the flight, book the room, fill out the paperwork for the registration. You are going. So it was really interesting. It's like I never had to ask for anything. It was just assumed that I was going to join and I was going to be involved, which was a great way to get introduced to APMP. Wow, Ali, you are so blessed and you're so lucky. You know, most people have to feel long. (laughs) APMP has to publish uh, why you need to come to the conference every single time. (laughs) It was in 2000. Um, It was in Florida. I remember at the time I went, I hardly knew anybody being a new member, but everyone was so friendly and so giving that I left those few days later with friends and colleagues and people I could email and contact if I had a question. It was just such an incredible experience. And I also walked away with my first volunteer job on the editorial advisory board for the journal. Yes. So I could come back and say, I met people and I volunteered for something. So they were very happy. (laughs) (laughs) That's amazing. How long were you with us, part of the editorial journal, um, Ali? I was involved in the journal until about, let me think now, uh, I would say 2012, roughly. I was on the editorial advisory board. Then I was books editor. I reviewed books for the journal. Then I became assistant editor. I did that for a few years, and then when our managing editor, John Elder, uh, became ill and had to step down, 
Um, I assumed the manage, managing editor role of the journal, and I did that till about 2012. And simultaneously, uh, APMP used to have a newsletter, a quarterly newsletter called Perspective. And I was also the editor of Perspective. So I was actually hands-on with both publications that were going out at that time, which was very rewarding. It could sometimes get very hectic, especially if you had proposals going on at the same time. But it was very rewarding because, again, I got to talk to so many different people and learn so many things. It was a really great position to be in. It's fascinating to hear that, Ali. You you made it sound so simple, but uh, but I mean, like with like two thousand two two thousand all all the time, Ali. How did you kind of the how did the whole journal process work, Ali? I mean, like people sent to you. Well, fortunately, um, Jamie Sokolow, who handles the publications now, was also uh, in charge of the journal, and he was a wonderful resource for me. He he was so helpful and such a wonderful delight to work with. Uh, he did a lot of the recruiting for the articles. People would contact him. He would vet the authors and the topics of the journals. He worked with the editorial advisory board to get the articles peer reviewed. And then once that was done, he would hand it off to me. I would go through, do an edit, put everything together. Uh, Colleen Jolly, who was with the 24-hour company at the time, handled the production aspect of, of laying out the journal and getting it printed and, and handling that aspect. So I would coordinate that with her. And then we had another company whose name escapes me right now who mailed them all out. At the time, they weren't electronic. You got a physical journal in the mail. So it took several months to get a journal out. At the time, the journal came out twice a year. And we worked that whole six-month cycle between each journal. It, it was quite a, a process. and uh, But I think each journal had its own charm, had its own personality, if you will, and we were very proud of, of what we accomplished, all of us. We were very proud to be providing such a, a quality product for the membership that not only looked good, but provided a lot of very relevant, timely, and helpful information for the membership. Yes, Ali, it sounds amazing, Ali. I mean, like, you know, that's that's what fascinates me and Ashley for the whole thing. You know, what you, in addition to your day, you know, the, 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 in, in the very first session, we talked about the complex projects that you worked. And this whole thing is volunteering, where in addition to your, you know, daily work schedules, you, you and few others gave this time and effort to build up the whole body and the journal aspects. And that's what, you know, like, we, we are... We are pretty much fascinated and in awe, actually. So thank you so much for all the great work as a team. So thank you. In between, you also took a, a chair position in your local chapter, Ali. Is that right? And how was that for working part of the local chapter as well? Yes, when I first joined APMP, Maryland, Central Maryland region had the Chesapeake chapter, which ended up folding. Mm. And a few years later in, I want to say, mm, 2012, 2013, that area, a group of folks led by Jessica Morgenstern got together and decided to revive Chesapeake chapter. And I was asked if I wanted to help with that resurrection. And I said, yes. So, oh, Jessica and some folks from Lofeld and 
uh, got together and we reapplied, did everything we had to to be uh, recognized once again as an APMP chapter. I started out that first year, I did uh, marketing and promotions chair, and then I was chapter chair for a few years after that, helping to grow the chapter, helping to get people to know that we exist. Um, had to step away for a few years um, due to some personal things that happened in my life, but I'm happy to say that last month I rejoined Chesapeake Chapter as the Vice Chair of Marketing and Communications. So I'm back involved with my local chapter again, and I'm very excited about that. <laughs> That's so nice, uh, Ali, and I, I don't think you will get away from this, I think, because when you start to give, I think that you know, people will always need mentors and people like you to always, it gives a lot of comfort, a lot of stability, a lot of security to have people like you. And I'm quite happy that you're already there doing that. You know, uh, Ali, you know, what inspired us to launch this was your APMP History 3 Series article, Ali, do you remember? Yes, I remember the history article. Yes, I think that's what was the trigger point for us to do this. If you can share uh, how the whole uh, kind of idea of about the APMP history article came, how did you collect it, um, information about those 28 founders and uh, you know, all the stuff, Ali, that will be fascinating for us. Well, John Elder and I were at the international conference and we were talking about how APMP started and nobody really knew how APMP started and what was all involved, what what went into, like you just asked me, what went into bringing Chesapeake chapter back to life? Like, well, what went into creating APMP? What, what sparked all this? John had been a member of APMP a few years longer than I, so he had the relationships with a lot of the founding members. So he did the research. He contacted them, um, did some interviews. They voluntarily gave us some of the artifacts that they had, brochures from the first conferences, the original articles of incorporation. They, they sent us copies of all that material. And then John passed it on off to me, and I wrote, used all that information that he gathered to actually write the article. And then he would review it and make sure I got everything right and attributed the correct quotes to the people and everyone. And, and that's how we did it. It was, it was a team effort between the two of us. It was a lot of fun. We, it was amazing, some of the old pictures and things that folks sent us. It was a lot of fun. Yes, Sally. I think even looking back, I think the article was published in mid two thousand. Sally, is that right? Somewhere in two thousand five. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, you know, if two thousand five people don't know, imagine now, fifteen years down the line. I think people expect this. Yeah. It just happened one day suddenly, and uh, it's it, that's that's classic. And your relationship with John Elder Ali and how you know, how that kind of contributed to your growth as well. If you could share some insights, that'd be great. Well, that's a funny story, how I met John. I was my very first APMP meeting. I went to uh, what was then still Chesapeake Chapter. And I smoked back then. Uh, went outside to have a cigarette, and there was uh, some people. And, of course, everybody always has that conversation, asks that question, how did you get into proposals? And so everyone was, we were talking, and, and someone asked that question, what were you doing before you got into proposals? And John was there having a cigarette as well, and he said that uh, one of the previous jobs he had had before he joined 
the proposal world was that he worked at a local radio station here in Baltimore. And of course, that piqued my interest. And somebody said, you know, they used to do something in Baltimore. And I said, oh, I used to listen to that radio station all the time. So as a matter of fact, they used to have a morning DJ at the time who was very popular. And he was in this really bad science fiction film that my brother worked on in the late 70s. And John's eyes kind of glazed over and he said, the alien factor. And I said, yes, that was the film. He said, I had to go to the premiere of that film because that this jockey was my boss. I said, I was at this premiere of that film too because my brother was in it. And so that was just got us started talking about Baltimore. And it turned out that we had been at some of the same places at the same time, but we didn't know each other at the time. So that just got us uh, something in common. And then, of course, we kept running into each other all the time at APMP events. And so out of that, we developed first a, a colleague, APMP colleague relationship. But then as we started working on the journal, he became a very dear and a very good friend. And then, of course, we all know that um, John was diagnosed with kidney cancer mm -hmm. in 2008, 2009 timeframe, and uh, eventually did, uh, unfortunately, pass away from that disease. And, and he is sorely missed. He was so proud of his affiliation with APMP and just loved being a part of the organization, loved participating, and was very proud of, of APMP and would do anything for them. So I was very happy when they renamed the, the Journal Award, the John Elder Award. I know that um, uh, he was smiling. He, he, he gets a kick out of it every time they give that award out, I'm sure. Because it probably would make him very proud to know that there's an award named for him now from an organization he was so proud to be part of. I'm glad that you're having this talk, actually. You know, it's being slightly emotional now, but... <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what it's all about. That's good. And uh, doing the conferences, uh, the journals, and also with the chapter, you also spoke as in many topics in many of the conferences. Uh, can you share some? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I have uh, spoken at several of the international conferences as well as some of the local chapters as well. Um, chap Chesapeake chapter and NCA chapter, which is closer to the DC, Virginia uh, area, um, have a symposia. In October, I have spoken at that. I have spoken at several APMP conferences, have presented, have been privileged to present with Kristen Dufresne several times at APMP conferences. She is also a good friend and a great proposal colleague. And I think I enjoy presenting because and this is going to sound silly, maybe, but because I have been involved in this industry for so long, I enjoy sharing my stories. Mm -hmm. I enjoy talking with people. I, when I met, I ran a proposal center for a couple companies and mentoring the junior proposal staff and being able to share my stories of, you know, I remember when this happened, or I remember that. It, it's so rewarding to me because it's, it's a fun way to share information, but it also teaches them. Say, well, I remember when this happened, and this is how we solved that problem. It might sound like just a funny story to them, but what they don't realize is in the back of their mind, they're filing that away, and when that situation approaches, they're going to say, oh, you know, I remember Allie talked about that one day, and this is how she said they solved it, so let's try that and see if it works. It's, it's interesting to 
not only share the information with the audience. Whenever I present, I always tell people I'm not here to present. I'm here to lead a discussion because everyone in the room comes from their own background, their own experiences, their own work environments. And so I'm. someone may ask me a question and I might say, this is how I would handle it or this is how I did handle it. But someone else in the audience might say, I faced that situation too, but I handled it a different way and it also worked. Or I handled it this way and it didn't work. So don't ever try that because it doesn't work. Don't do it that way. And we learn from everybody. We all learn from each other. And that to me is really what giving a presentation or giving a training workshop is all about. We're all there to learn from each other. How was it co-presenting with Kirsten Dumfrey? Oh, that was a blast. I really, I really enjoyed that. That, that was a lot of fun. <laughs> Can you share <laughs> one or two things about Kirsten and how you kind of partnered up on the presentations and stuff? Um, well, I mean, it, it, it just basically nine times out of 10 just grew out of conversations with other people. Mm. It, it just kind of started organically, really, just having a conversation with someone and somebody would either say, you know, we should, or why hasn't anybody ever, or you know what would be a really good idea? And then it just kind of takes off from there. And you say, well, let's give it a try or let's do it. And and it works. So recently, uh, you're doing a lot of work in with small businesses, and especially I really love your tagline, which says, I help small business find extra time each day. Can you share a little bit about that, Ali? I love working with small businesses. I've spent the bulk of my career working for small and mid-sized companies. And so I understand their pain. I understand what it's like when you are the proposal department and you have to wear every hat or you work for a small business and part of your job is being the proposal department, but you also have other duties as assigned. And you don't have the financial and personnel resources that a large contractor like a Lockheed Martin or a Northrop Grumman or a you know, GDIT, you don't have the money to apply. And so you have to be very creative in how you apply your resources and you have to apply them very smart to get the most you can out of the little you have. You have to work smart with what you have. And sometimes small businesses I find pass up opportunities because they don't think because they aren't um, have access to those types of resources that they can't go up against a Lockheed Martin or GDIT and win. So they pass up opportunities because they think because they're a small company, they don't have a shot. So I enjoy going in and working with them and helping them identify the opportunities that give them the best probability of win. Help and helping them put the processes and tools in place to take advantage of what they do have and to show them you can be just as competitive as any other company out there. You just have to be a little more creative and resourceful in how you do it. Oh, wow, Allie. It sounds like you have been able to help a lot of small businesses really pursue some opportunities that um, can make a big difference for their organizations. Um, it, it is. It's very. I've always said throughout my career that the, the people will ask me, "You've been doing this for so long. Why? Why are you still working in proposals?" And my answer has always been because it's the only position I've ever had where I can see a direct correlation between what I do every day and the company bottom line. If I support a proposal team and they win, and because of that win, a small business has now doubled their number of employees because they had to hire so many people to work on that program. Or they can 
offer a new benefit to their employees because they now have the revenue coming in and they can afford to do that. That is very rewarding. That's really making an impact on someone's personal life. And it's it's good. You can pat yourself on the back and say, I played a small part in making that happen. And it's just one of, it is just an incredibly rewarding career. It is frustrating. It is stressful. I understand that. But it is also, I think, one of the most rewarding careers anyone could have. Absolutely. Ali, your passion is so infectious. <laughs> um, we're going to lighten things up a little bit now. Um, we have some surprise rapid fire questions for you. The first one is, okay. would, you, <laughs> would you rather go back to age five with everything you know now or know now everything your future self will learn? Wow, that's a tough one. I think I would rather go back and tell my past self what I know now. I don't I don't think I would want to know what the future holds. That would take all the fun out of it. <laughs> half the half the fun is, is the not knowing and you know, sometimes being pleasantly surprised. So I I think I'm I I have very few regrets in my life. So I think I would probably just want to go back and just tell my former self or my younger self you know, make this decision instead of that decision. You'll be happier in the long run. Trust me. Um, (laughs) Yeah. I don't think I would want to know the future. That's great. Okay. So what is the most unusual fear that you have? (laughs) I am afraid of thunderstorms. I don't like thunder. And I will tell you why. It is, a, it is a completely irrational fear that I carried forward from childhood. When you are a kid and you hear thunder, what did your parents tell you? You know, oh, it's the angels in heaven bowling and somebody got a strike or it's clouds <laughs> banging in together. They, they would give you some very simplistic explanations so you wouldn't be afraid. In my house, when I was young, uh, because my oldest brother was a horror film fan. When I asked at the age of three or four years old, what is that noise when there would be thunder? My brother told me that it was the damn souls in hell banging on the door to be re-released back onto the earth. And when there was a really loud bang of thunder, he would look at me and say, my, they almost got out that time. (sighs) And so I would get scared of that. I would start crying and my mother would come running in with wrong and say, oh, damn souls in hell almost got out. And she would go over and hit my brother and say, will you stop telling her that stuff? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I carried that forward with me and I still freak out whenever I hear a thunderstorm. Even though I know logically what it is, I still associate that fear with, with thunder. Oh my goodness, your older brother. <laughs> yeah, we had we had a great time together. <laughs> Sounds like it. <laughs> um, so Allie, what is your favorite TV show? Oh my. Right right now I'm really into the mask singer. Oh. That show fascinates me. Yeah, it is. I'm I'm really into that right now. And I'm catching up on House of Cards. I didn't watch House of Cards when it was originally on. Mm. And I just recently started watching that. So I'm I'm really into that right now, too. Yeah, sometimes it's nice to be able to watch when you want and not have to wait for the next episode, right? <laughs> That's true. That is one, one advantage. <laughs> um, what do you wish people would stop asking you? Oh, that's one question. I would think people would stop asking me. I don't know. I don't think there is a question people always ask me. Okay. Um, I don't don't think there is one. (laughs) What about a movie or book character that you're most similar to?
movie character? Well, my favorite book character, um, um, one of my favorite books is at a shrug by Ayn Rand. And so I always uh, admired Dagny Taggart because she was such a, an innovative and, and unabashedly unashamed businesswoman who just didn't care what people thought. She just would bulldoze right over you, say, this is a job. This is what we need to get done. This is how we're going to do it. And she didn't let anyone stand in her way, and she didn't play games. And I admired that. So I would have to say probably my favorite book character, if I could be anyone, I would want to be like Dagny Taggart. She sounds great. <laughs> Um, what's the biggest lesson in life um, that you've learned? Always expect the unexpected. Mm. You good. never know what's coming around the corner. Always yeah. expect the unexpected. Um, is there a random stranger that has had the biggest impact on your life? Mm. A random stranger. Well, this this happened, oh my gosh, maybe 10, 12 years ago. And it was a small thing, but I've never forgotten it. And it's always made me wonder. Um, My husband was still alive at the time. And he had gone away on a business trip while he was gone we had a major blizzard Hmm. and it just so happened that the days we had the blizzard, I had the flu. So the day he was coming back, I said, I need to go clear a parking spot out in the driveway because when he gets home, he's not going to have a place to park because there's three feet of snow in the driveway. So I'm sick of the dog. I go outside. I start trying to shovel a path in the driveway. And I can only do so much because I wear myself out. So I would go out and I would work for a little bit. Then I would have to go inside and sit down. Then I'd go out and I'd work a little bit. And I was outside shoveling. And this man came walking up the street. I've never seen that man before in the neighborhood. And I never saw him again after this day. But he walked up to me and he said, what are you doing? And I explained to him what I was doing. He said, go in the house and sit down. I will do this for you. And he shoveled out our entire driveway, cleared a spot so that when my husband came home, he could get his car in the driveway and park. And he just left the shovel in in front of the door and went on his way. And I have no idea who that man was. But it just struck me that here he was just walking by. He didn't know me, but he was willing to stop and say, what are you, obviously you need help. What are you trying to do? I will help you go, go sit down. You're sick and look like you're ready to fall over. And that just really struck me. And so it's, it's taught me the lesson of, Be cognizant of what's going on around you because, hey, you never know when you're walking by somebody who might need help. And if you are able to help, stop and do it. Wow. What a great story and what a great lesson that you've taken from that. Um, If you could replace the handshake as a greeting, what interesting new greeting would you replace it with? Oh, I'm a hugger. (laughs) So I I would say everybody had to hug. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> had, to, had to give a hug. <laughs> um, who haven't you seen or talked to in a while and hope they're doing okay? Oh, I haven't. I have two nieces in California, and I haven't talked to either of them in a while. My brother keeps me up to date on how they're doing. They're both very, very busy with their with their own jobs right now. So I understand why I haven't heard from them. But, you know, I, I hope they're doing okay. And I hope I get to uh, have a nice long gab fest so we can catch up soon. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> A 
thank you, uh, Ali. Hope you enjoyed that round. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did. That's fun. <laughs> Um, looking back, Ali, I think you know you you have an amazing career and and you kind of touch so many lives. Who are the people who have been the most influential in your life and your career that you are grateful for? I think my my brother Skip was very influential growing up. He he taught me a lot about life. He's five years older than I am. So we're close enough in age that by the time I was in high school, we got pretty close and we were hanging out a lot together. We shared a lot of the same interests. So we would go to the movies together or go let out, listen to music together, go to concerts. And I think he introduced me to a lot of music and film and art that uh, has stayed with me through my life. I think uh, my husband was a very influential person in my life. He was always very encouraging and always quick to say, you know, I know you can do it. And when I accomplished it to say, I'm proud of you. So I would have to say he was an influential person in my life. Now, my career, the most influential person in my career is a gentleman I worked for named Tony Bent at National Semiconductor. And he was influential to me because uh, I worked there early in my career, early in my proposal career. He was the first manager I ever reported to who took the time to ask me, what do you want to do in your career? And let's put together a plan to make it happen. Usually it was, you know, you're doing a good job. This is where you need to improve. He was the first person to really sit down and and ask me, what are your career goals? What do you want to accomplish? What would you like? What do you need to learn? Let's do a gap analysis. You want to do this? All right, you need to take this class or you need to uh, improve in this area. And he was the first person who really sat down and and created a career path for me within that company. And it was very uh, advanced my career a lot. And it also taught me how to be a good manager. And later on in my career, when I was in the position where I had employees reporting to me, I would often think back to some of the things that he did and the advice that he had given me in my career and and applied that to how I interacted and mentored uh, the employees who reported to me. So I think probably he was one of the most influential people in my career. And I run into him occasionally, and I always thank him. I always say, you know, I am where I am today because you got me started. That's amazing. Um, I think the, the the last line that you said it's it's the best line, Ali. I mean, like we are where we are because few people sent us in the right direction. That's brilliant. So, what's the best piece of advice you've received, and from whom? I think the best piece of advice I ever got was. Um, from a woman I worked with named Joan. And she taught me when it, when you work on a proposal, something is inevitably going to go wrong. No matter how well you plan, no matter how well you think you've got everything set up, something will eventually go wrong. It could be something very minor, or it could be something major that just causes everything to blow up. But if you try to anticipate what could go wrong and always have a contingency plan ready to go in case, you'll be able to weather the storm and you won't panic and it won't seem so horrible. Um, and she taught me that we were working on a proposal and they asked for 
three past performances. And she said, we are going to identify five. And I said, why? We only need three. She said, no, we're going to identify five just in case we get down the line and we realize that one of these can't be used for whatever reason. The scope of work isn't what we think it is, where we find out that the customer isn't too crazy about us. We're not going to get a good review. We have others already vetted, ready to go, that we can insert in its place, and it won't be a big deal, won't cause us to lose any time. And so I worked with her, and because of that, uh, over the years, um, I've been able to say, you know, okay, we're going to you know, identify a couple extra key personnel because somebody might decide they don't want to be part of this program or they quit and go to another company. So we're going to have another resume ready to go, go on the proposal. We're going to have the printer and the copier, they're going to have come in and do preventive maintenance and clean everything, make sure everything's in top working order so we're less likely to have an equipment malfunction while we're in the middle of printing the proposal. All those little things that, as much as possible, have a plan B, think disaster recovery, have a plan B, have a contingency in place so that when what goes wrong finally does go wrong, it doesn't throw you. That's a great advice, um, Ali. Thank you so much for that. So we'll, uh, yeah, final round. All right, Ali, you've had an amazing career. Um, and I've learned so much just listening to you over the past 45 minutes or so. Um, what's one thing you wish you had known when you began your career? Take people where they are. And by that, I mean, work with a proposal team. You're working with folks that may or may not have experience working in proposals who may have worked on a proposal and it was a bad experience and the last thing they want to do is work on another one. Don't assume that everyone shows up anxious to be working on this proposal or that this proposal is as big a priority to them as it is to you. If you're the proposal manager, that proposal is your number one priority. If you are the technical SME who is also supporting a program and you're doing this proposal in the evening after you finish your day job, the proposal isn't as high a priority for you. It's important, but it's not your number one priority. Your day job is. So you have to take each individual person where they are, understand if they're new to proposals, they might need a little bit more mentoring then help them out. Do you need to do some just-in-time training? Don't, don't assume that just because management assigns someone to a proposal that the team is automatically going to mesh and everybody's going to know exactly what they need to do and they're going to go off and do it and they're going to do it perfectly and life is going to just be a, a merry song. That's great advice. And I know I definitely made that mistake early on in my career. <laughs> um, if someone asked to be your assistant and learn all that you know, what would you teach them? Working on a proposal is in many ways the backbone of a company. I would often tell uh, employees who reported to me when they would come and complain about folks and the proposal team weren't listening to them or weren't cooperating with them. I uh, would just remember one thing. Every person in this company, from the CEO down to the cleaning crew who comes through at night, has a job today because somebody at some time submitted a proposal that won. And if you keep that in mind and you remember 
the value that we bring to the company, it makes the hard times a little easier to take. So I think that's the first lesson I would tell anyone is, you know, you have to have fun. It is a serious business. It's an important job to have. You you have to make it a little bit of fun or else you'll go crazy. Hmm. But never remember that, you know, basically everyone in that job, everyone in that company has a job because you're winning proposals. Yeah, it's a great message and always something we should remember as proposal professionals. Um, So, Ali, you've accomplished so much over your career and you've done so many things. What's next for you? I have absolutely no idea. (laughs) I don't don't like I told you I don't like to know the future. Um, (laughs) Right now, my 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 focus is my company and building my company. Um. We've only been in business since 2014, so we're still still growing, still having a little bit of growing pains. So that's my focus right now. Um, what comes after this? I have absolutely no idea. What I would really like to do, um, I recently added video marketing to one of the services that uh, Able Solutions offers. And I work with my brother who has a post-production media company in Southern California. And my ultimate goal is I would like to eventually get into uh, some film production and expand that video uh, marketing to doing some video training and eventually film production and have Able Solutions turn into a a, a film studio production house. That would be pretty cool. I think that would be, that would be fun. Yeah, that sounds really exciting. Ali, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ali, for your time today. It's been a real privilege to have you with us at Scribble Talk. Wish you all the good health and happiness and success with your company. Please continue to inspire bid and proposal professionals and everybody around you, Ali. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure and a delight to speak with both of you. To our listeners, thank you so much for tuning in. Please visit batchyscribble.com forward slash podcast to listen to this episode and check out any of our other previously recorded episodes. If you've enjoyed today's interview, don't forget to subscribe, review, and share the Scribble Talk podcast. We hope you'll check out our next episode where we interview another industry expert and special guest. Until then, it's Ashley Kays, Pasca Syndrome, signing off. <laughs>